Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I am Rachel with Right Side Blonde. Given the recent congressional hearing about UFOs and the first one in over 50 years, I might add, I thought it was a fitting time to read from the April 2000 issue of George about aliens and it's called All the President's Little Green Men. Before I jump into the article, I wanted to just show a little bit of symbolism on the front cover of this month's George. To be honest, this stance jumped right out at me right when I saw this cover, so um, some of you will know what that means. Besides Bono's pose on the cover of this George, there's another show of symbolism on one of the advertisements too. It's funny, once you know what to look for, you just can't not see it, and I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way. So I just thought I'd show those. If you haven't watched the congressional hearing yet, it took place on May 17th, Tuesday. I have listened to the whole thing, and I have a lot of mixed feelings about the entire thing. We recently had Bev Trout on, who is a ufologist. She's been a ufologist for over 27 years. She worked for MUFON, which is a mutual UFO network, um, which was started in 1969. As we all know, the Roswell crash happened in 1947. The government quickly covered it up and said it was a weather balloon. And there's been speculation ever since that time as to what that really was. So with this congressional hearing, the public one I might add, obviously we can't see the closed door one, but there was a lot of um, contradiction in what they were saying. What programs that we have on the record? It's also been reported uh, that there have been UAP observed uh, and interacting with and flying over sensitive military facilities, particularly not just ranges, but uh, some facilities housing our strategic nuclear forces. Uh, one such incident allegedly occurred uh, uh, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, in which 10 of our nuclear ICBMs were rendered inoperable. At the same time, a glowing red orb was observed overhead. I'm not commenting on the accuracy of this. I'm simply asking you whether you're aware of it and whether you have any comment on the accuracy of that report. Let me pass that to Mr. Bray. You've been looking at UAPs over the last uh, three years. Uh, that data is not uh, within the holdings of the UAP task force. Okay, but are you aware of the, the report or that the data exists somewhere? I have uh, I have heard stories. I have not seen the official data on that. So you've just seen informal stories, no official assessment that you've done or exists within DOD that you're aware of uh, regarding the Malmstrom incident. Uh, all I can speak to is you know what's within my cognizance, the UAP task force, and we have not looked at that incident. Well, I would say I mean it's a pretty high-profile incident. Uh, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, but that's out there in, in the ether. You're, you're the guys investigating it. I mean, if, who else is doing it? If something was officially brought to our attention, we would look at it. Uh, there are many things that are out there in the ether that aren't officially brought to our attention. So how would it have to be officially brought to your attention? I'm official. bringing it to your attention. Sure, so, <laughs> this is pretty official. Sure. So we'll go back and take a look at it, but generally there is some um, authoritative figure that says there is an incident that occurred. We'd like you to look at this. Uh, but in terms of just tracking what may be in the media that says that something occurred at this time, at this place, um, there are probably a, a lot of leads that we would have to follow up on. I don't think we have resources to do that right now. Well, I don't claim to be an authoritative figure, but for what it's worth, I would like you to look in, into it. And sure. if, if for another reason, you could dismiss it and say this is not worth wasting resources on. We'll do. Um, and then finally, are, are you aware of a document that appeared around uh, 2019, uh, sometimes called the Admiral Wilson Memo or EW Notes Memo? I am, I am, I am not. You're not. Are you trying to... I'm not personally aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a document in which, again, I'm not commenting on the veracity. Uh, I was hoping you would help me with that, in which a former uh, head of DIA claims mm -hmm. to have had a conversation with the Dr. Eric Wilson uh, and claims to have uh, sort of been made aware of certain um, contractors or, or DOD programs um, that he tried to get uh, fuller access to and was denied uh, access to. Um, so you're not aware of, uh, of that? I'm not aware of Congressman. Uh, in my 10 seconds remaining, then, I, I guess I just would ask Mr. Chairman unanimous consent to enter that memo into the record. Without objection. I think there might be some games being played here, but I would encourage all of you to watch it and put in the comments what you think about it. One thing I really didn't like about the hearing was having to listen to Shifty Shift for some time. Really not one of my favorite things to do, but I did it for the sake of this episode, so you're welcome. <laughs> All right, let's get into the article. It's called All the President's Little Green Men. It's by Carl M. Cannon. 
Forget problems here on Earth. What keeps presidents up at night are obsessions about invading aliens. No kidding. What do presidents think about when they're alone? Well, in my family, we know from two generations' experience of covering the White House that sometimes presidents ponder invasions from outer space. About 15 years ago, while doing research for his third book on Ronald Reagan, my father, Lou Cannon, came across some fascinating details about the Strategic Defense Initiative, Reagan's plan to deploy thousands of smart missiles as an umbrella against a Soviet attack. Thanks to the memoirs of Mikhail Gorbachev and his aides, we now know that the $17 billion spent on SDI during the Reagan years helped end the Cold War because the Soviets could not afford to match it. Back in the 80s, the Washington establishment considered missile defense an unworkable pipe dream and dubbed the program Star Wars. That image persisted this January when the Pentagon's $100 million anti-missile test launch failed to hit its target over the Pacific Ocean. In the wake of that failure, President Clinton has until this summer to decide whether to proceed with the first operational phase of SDI, which is scheduled to be put in place by 2005 at a cost of about $13 billion. For his part, Reagan always thought SDI money was well spent. Total costs to date are approximately $60 billion. He told his aides he considered it immoral for the two superpowers to have their nuclear arsenals targeted at each other's cities. To underscore the point that protecting, not incinerating, the civilian populations of the world was what SDI was all about, Reagan offered to share the Star Wars technology with the Soviet Union. Some of Reagan's own national security officials privately assured reporters that the president had misspoken. But Reagan wasn't easily dissuaded. What if aliens from outer space invaded Earth, he would ask at White House meetings. In that event, wouldn't mankind quickly put aside all sectarian, racial, and ideological differences and work together? Reagan meant this as a metaphor. He wasn't actually thinking of using Star Wars on aliens, but his national security advisor, General Colin L. Powell, found Reagan's fixation unnerving all the same. Powell worked vigilantly to keep this theme out of the president's speeches, but he had only limited success. Reagan even tried out his interplanetary invasion theory on Gorbachev the first time they met at the 1985 Geneva summit. The Soviet leader responded by changing the subject. When Reagan returned home, he regaled a group of high school students from Falston, Maryland, with the story of how he had talked to Gorbachev about what would happen if Earthlings were attacked by an alien race. Just think how easy his task in mind might be in these meetings that we held. If suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet outside in the universe, Reagan told the teenagers, we'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries, and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on Earth together. Powell was convinced that Reagan, an ex-actor who was also a science fiction fan, became fixated on the notion of an attack from outer space as a result of movies he'd seen. A year after the phenomenal success of E.T., Reagan startled some congressional leaders when, during a meeting on arms control, he spoke at length about the movie War Games. Powell believed that Reagan's alien invasion scenario was inspired by the 1951 sci-fi classic The Day the Earth Stood Still. Whenever Reagan waxed eloquent during White House meetings about interplanetary threats, Powell would roll his eyes and tell his staff, here come the little green men again. Much of this was in my father's biography, President Reagan, Role of a Lifetime, and probably would have been remembered chiefly as evidence of the president's charming idiosyncrasies. Years later, however, while I was covering the White House, I was stunned to hear President Clinton talking publicly about little green men. It seemed innocent enough the first time, in a July 15, 1996 interview with Tom Brokaw to help launch MSNBC's Internight, Clinton agreed to answer questions over the internet. One query came from a moviegoer who had seen that summer's blockbuster, Independence Day, which features an alien invasion and the incineration of the White House and the Capitol. Could we really fight these guys off, or what, Mr. President? The questioner asked. An animated Clinton responded that he loved the movie, and in fact had seen it at the White House with actor Bill Pullman, who plays the role of president. We'd fight them off. We'd find a way to win, Clinton said, but then he kept going. The good thing about Independence Day is there's an ultimate lesson for that, for the problems right here on Earth, he said. We whipped that problem, the alien invasion, by working together with all these countries. And all of a sudden, the differences we had with them seemed so small. No green men yet. But three days later, Clinton mentioned Independence Day again, this time, as Reagan had done, to an audience of teenagers. You know, you see story after story about how the movie audiences leap up and cheer at the end of the movie when we vanquish the alien invaders, he said. These people have all of a sudden put aside the differences that seemed so trivial once their existence was threatened. Lately, as he prepares himself emotionally for the end of his presidency, 
Clinton has been talking about the little green men more and more. In an October interview with Cox newspapers that dealt primarily with hate crimes and race relations, Clinton invoked Independence Day to make the point that skin color would seem a small difference indeed if our planet were attacked by aliens. Jake Seward, the deputy press secretary who sat in on the interview, remembers laughing when the president drifted off into his musings on celestial attacks. But Clinton, like Reagan before him, was becoming irrepressible on this point. The next night, he brought the subject up twice at a ceremony honoring the nation's best public schools. I get so angry at all these conflicts around the world and these expressions of hatred here at home based on race or religion or sexual orientation, Clinton said. If we were being attacked by space aliens, like in that movie Independence Day, we'd all be looking for a foxhole to get in together. The audience sort of chuckled along with the president, but later Clinton said, You all laughed when I said this before, but you know, if we were being attacked by space aliens, we wouldn't be playing these kinds of games. Interesting way of saying that. This time, realizing that the president wasn't talking literally about spacemen, but metaphorically about racism, his audience listened respectfully. It's tempting to believe that it's a quirky coincidence that two of our last three commanders-in-chief have been sci-fi buffs who were inspired by the movies, but the presidential alien fixation is more than that. The presidency of the United States is a job that has been held by only 42 people in the nation's history, and the 10 who have served in the nuclear age have tended to feel responsible for the entire world. It is good that they do. And it is understandable if, in the restless hours of the night, they look out their bedroom window, past the Truman balcony to the eerily lit Jefferson Memorial, and become philosophical about how to unite mankind. The danger that preoccupied Reagan was communism. With Clinton, it is racial, ethnic, and religious hatred. While it's easy to poke fun at leaders who worry about marauding invaders from outer space, it's also true that such thoughts suggest these presidents are looking outside themselves for answers to great questions beyond any earthly wisdom to the very stars themselves. I, for one, find this reality not unnerving, but comforting. I don't know if you caught that little slip of words in this article, but I sure did. When he said, you all laughed when I said this before, but you know, if we were attacked by space aliens, we wouldn't be playing these kinds of games. What kind of games is he talking about here? And then it goes on to tell us that metaphorically what he was talking about was racism. So interesting, he called it a game. Maybe you also noticed the words little green men as much as I did. It seemed like they popped out of the article at least four times, I'm guessing. So I looked up little green men in Gematria just to see what it was. Little green men comes to 159. 159 also comes to John F. Kennedy Jr. 159 also comes to the number 78 spelled out. And 78, the number, comes to Kennedy. Knowing these values, to me, it puts an extra special meaning on this line that Colin Powell says. Here come the little green men again. One can wish, right? Regarding the congressional hearing on the UFO or UAP is what they call them, I'm not sure what their motive is here. Here are my thoughts. They can either be slowly waking up people to the possibility that they do exist and they're slowly going to release more information over time and they're just letting little amounts of information trickle out so that we don't completely freak out the population. Another probability is they might be preparing the population for a scare event. Who knows? And a third probability is perhaps they're just giving us enough information to keep us satisfied for the time being and make us feel like we got something, but really we're not getting any depth to what they're telling us. Based on what I saw the congressional hearing, I think the third scenario is likely at play here. But what do you guys think? If you'd like to learn more about aliens, UFOs, UAPs, definitely check out our videos we've done with Bev. You'll definitely learn something. I know my mind has been blown several times by what she has shared with us, so look for those. That does it for today's episode of The George Collection. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and I will see you next time. George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided. I mean, 
actually taking a cue from from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election that that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly, the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms, uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process. And while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines, per se, hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.